It's football at four here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Let's bring John McMullen into the conversation as uh, the first depth chart is out. We kind of chewed on this for a little bit in the first hour of the show, John. Just a little confusion, I guess, more so than, um, you know, uh, why is this? But uh, how are you, how are you reading this running back depth chart? Well, you read it, uh, Corey would be fourth and Wendell's fifth, so that's just because they have so many bodies. That's just how it was formatted. All right, so, so Wendell is is the fifth running yeah. back. Josh Adam is sixth and so forth and so on. Boston Scott, I think, is seven, and then uh, Danell Pumphrey would be eighth. So that's how – but that's not – and I have to correct you. This is by no means official. It's unofficial. It's made by the PR department. Uh, and this happens all over the NFL. Coaches don't want to be bothered with this stuff, and they just kind of cobble something together for the game notes, and that's where all this stuff comes from. I, I would not take it very seriously, and I, I posted the quote on, on my Twitter account from Jim Schwartz talking about depth charts, and he explains the whole thing. Yeah. The coaches don't make them. Ignore it. Uh, if you want to get excited by it, feel free, but it doesn't mean that. I'm in, man. I'm excited. I want to see uh, where uh, Mark and uh, Michelle is going to uh, – he's the backup slot guy, it looks like. Yeah, well, it's interesting uh, because they did put a third receiver uh, on the depth chart, but they didn't put a nickel back, which kind of tells you. Yep. And uh, as Ken Flajol said, uh, and he's the linebacker's coach, they've lined up conservatively 70% in, in the nickel defense. So even that, I mean, the nickel defense is the base defense. That's the defense that's going to be on, on field uh, the most. And they don't even have a nickel back on there. Yeah, we saw that uh, for the corners. It was Maddox and Darby as the starters, Douglas and Jones, the backup, Skandrick and Cravon LeBlanc. They have, uh, I guess, are the third string. And then, uh, see, this is where it gets a little weird, like, Josh Hawkins is in the fourth column, but there are guys listed below Skandrick in the third column. So I guess they're below, but they're so they're behind Josh Hawkins. Uh, yeah. Well, again, the well, first of all, Ronald Darby's not even practicing in team drills. He's doing individual stuff. I, I think the funniest part is Abante being ahead of Rasul Douglas. They have not been on the same side of the field once in training camp or or uh, spring work. So they don't even play the same position. One plays left corner, one plays right corner. Uh, and Jim will always say, as you get down to 53, then you start mixing guys. Sometimes you have to play on the other side, necessity because of injury. But when you have 90 guys uh, and you have the full offseason roster, you can afford to, to do these things. So the big – the big issue of training camp at corner has been Avante Maddox and Sidney Jones, and they have rotated each day. One plays the outside, one plays the slot, uh, and then it rotates back the next day, and it's continued to be that. Rasul has been the right corner. When Ronald Darby, interestingly, comes back, he had been the right corner. So that's where he's going to be. He's going to be ahead of Rasul Douglas. So, it, yeah, it's – and Josh mentioned on the phone it might have been an intern for all I know. Yeah, no, I, I well, we did discuss that this is probably some PR guy. We we know that this isn't gospel here, but we know that by the fact that there's three linebackers listed: Camus, who's hurt, Nigel Bradham, who's hurt, and Zach Brown, who uh, they have them both listed as uh, he has uh, listed as a starting outside linebacker. And we know there's very rarely three linebackers on the field. No, and that's what we just said with the nickel. So when you're playing the nickel 70% of the time, that means two linebackers are on the field. When Nigel's going to be one of them, but he's much like uh, Ronald Darby has been. He's only working in individual drills, has not gotten back to team drills yet. And then Camu is going to be the second one. He's, he was having a great camp, but now he's got the MCL sprain, so he's going to be out into the regular season. So now this week you saw with Camu going down, uh, the first team guys were Nate Gary and, and Zach Brown uh, in the nickel. And when they did play base, LJ Fort was the middle linebacker. So, uh, 
Yeah, I, like I said, don't get too excited. If you're upset, don't get too excited. <laughs> if you're if you're thrilled, don't get too excited. Right. Don't uh, get crazy about this. So you're not reading uh, anything into Jordan Maialata being the third right tackle. I mean, does that suggest that there's a chance he doesn't make the team if he doesn't show some improvement? Uh, well, I, I I could see him not making the team if they needed a body elsewhere. Uh, if he's the tenth offensive lineman and he doesn't play well in the preseason, that's a lot of ifs. Uh, but yeah, he's anytime you're on the bottom ends of the roster and, and if you perform poorly, there's at least an opportunity uh, that you can get waived. They can probably get him through waivers and 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 get him on the uh, the practice squad. I think that what that's a nod to. He's been the second team right tackle throughout uh, the summer and spring behind Lane Johnson. Uh, took a lot of first-team reps in the spring when Lane was sitting out. Uh, but I, I think what that is is sort of a wink-wink to. Remember, Halapulavati Vaitai is starting at right guard because Brandon Brooks is not back in teamwork yet. Uh, if, if you get to the regular season and everybody's healthy and Brooks is at right guard and Lane's at right tackle, and something happens, well, yeah, then Vitae's probably going to be the right tackle. Right. Uh, he's got history playing it. He's got experience. And remember, you can only dress 46 guys on a game day. So you're only going to dress two backup offensive linemen. You're going to dress most likely a swing tackle and most likely an interior backup. And that's going to be Vitae over, uh, over Mylotta. So, wait a second. So, you say they're only going to address two offensive linemen on game day. So, the five starters and then two others? Yeah, generally that's what you do. Now, because of what the Eagles have, and Andre Dillard is a rookie, they might dress him because he's a first-round pick. So, you might have that extra guy. But most teams only dress seven on game day. And that's what your goal is to get. Your goal is to get a swing tackle as a backup who can play either left tackle or right tackle. And your goal is to get an interior backup, like a whiz type, who can play all three interior positions. That's the goal of every NFL team. They want those two backups. As I said, because Dillard's a first-round pick, they might give a nod to him. They might let him dress. Uh, but, but then you're losing a body on special teams. So it's always yeah. a decision, a, a, a give and take. Right. That's why I asked because you got Dillard and you got Wisniewski and you got Vitae. You would figure that, you know, Vitae and Wiz would probably be active because, you know, you need someone to be a center. Yeah. And, and I guess say Amala can play center. Of, yeah, he can. And, and that's where we talk about a lot of people have looked at Wiz who hasn't had a great camp and said maybe the Eagles want to go in a different direction because Isaac can play center. But these are the questions you have to ask yourself. I mean, one thing Jeff Stoutland has talked about a lot is if there is an injury, you don't want moving parts. So if Jason Kelsey does go down, yeah, Isaac can play center, but that means he's moving to center, Mm -hmm. and that means you need a new left guard as well. So these are the questions you kind of try to get through and, and try to ask yourself. But the goal is getting the best players on the field. Yeah, and, uh, you know, obviously that offensive line spot is always an eye-opener because not only, you know, you got Jason Peters who essentially misses parts of almost every game it feels like, but you got some aging guys out there. Uh, Kelsey's getting older. Brooks is coming off a major injury. So that position might be something that is uh, important on game day. Yeah, and and you're right. That might give the Eagles pause because Jason has had difficulty at least finishing games or playing complete games. So they might take that into account and say, we do need an extra body. Instead of seven, we need eight on game day. Uh, So that's something you do have to take into the equation. And uh, it is, don't underestimate the fact that the Eagles don't want to, to, not have their first round pick dressed. In other words, they don't want to deactivate right. because he's a first round pick. So I, I mean that plays into it as well. Uh, John McMullen at JF McMullen, the uh, Eagles' first uh, depth chart. Now it's not gospel right now, but uh, we're taking a look at some of the interesting things on there and, and see if we can read the tea leaves. How about JJ Arcega Whiteside? Is he 
putting it into their minds that they got to find a way to get something for him, you know, some some packages for him? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, he's the fourth receiver, so just from a standpoint of uh, attrition and – you know, Deshaun Jackson has a history of hamstring problems that at some point in the season, he's likely to miss a game or two. Uh, I, that wouldn't surprise me at all. And, and just the wear and tear those guys take uh, from running routes uh, every single play, I, I, that fourth guy is going to get some time. And just look at last year, Jordan Matthews. It was a roll. It wasn't significant but he he made some plays at times and and you're probably talking 25 maybe even 30 percent of the snaps so jj will have a role but it it will will not be significant when compared to those top three receivers which are all sean jeffrey and sean jackson and nelson aguilar yeah and uh it looks like shelton gibson was behind him on the depth chart and you wonder if shelton's job's in danger yeah, it is. I, I mean, at Shelton's point at this stage, as I said, there, there's so many receivers on this team. Uh, Greg Ward, who uh, Nelson Aguilar mentioned, deserves to be in the NFL and, and, and is really taking a step forward. Mark and Michelle uh, looks like an NFL player. Charles Johnson has been an NFL player. All of these guys are better receivers than Shelton Gibson. They just are. Uh, What they're not better than Shelton Gibson is at special teams. And if you keep five, if you keep six, that fifth and sixth receiver, they have to play on special teams. So that's another difficult decision you have to make. Your hope is everyone stays healthy. And if that's the case, the sixth receiver is not going to play at all. Well, especially when you have Miles Sanders listed as the kick returner in Sproles. you got two running backs doing special teams there. And I don't know how many running backs you keep, but that should be interesting. you got Howard, Sanders, Sproles, Clement, Smallwood. Josh Adams is listed as the sixth back. And then Boston Scott and Donnell Pumphrey as seventh and eighth. Yeah, well, I, and some of that also at this time of year is deference to the veteran. The guys have been here longer. Uh, Josh is Josh tends to show up when the pads come on uh, because he's such a big back and he is physical and he is capable of running between the tackles. Uh, so I did do think he could gain some ground with a good preseason. On the other hand, if he has a bad preseason, he's probably not going to make the team. Uh, we've been talking about Wendell Smallwood for years. The Eagles are always looking to replace him, mm-hmm. uh, and they never do because he – doesn't do anything great, but he does everything at least confidently. So he can run the ball. He's he's okay at that. He's okay as a receiver. He's okay as a pass protector. And he's okay as a special teams player. So he does a lot of different things. And, and then you start talking, do you keep four? Do you keep five? Um, with the injury history there, Darren Sproles the past couple years, I don't know if I'd be comfortable uh, uh, keeping only four running backs, but we always talk about that position being devalued. Uh, it's the same thing of the back end receivers. Yeah. If, if you're going to be a fifth back, if you're going to be even a fourth back, you've got to play on special teams. Uh, on the defensive side, Barnett Curry, Sharif Miller, uh, Graham, Josh Sweat, Hall. You wonder where Ostman would have fit in here had he had not got hurt, but. Uh, you got uh, Miller was interesting because I guess you go five, you go five there, right? Yeah, most likely. And and it would have been interesting if Joe stayed healthy because Joe was making this team uh, from talking to people. There's just no question. He was making this team. Uh, and then Josh Sweat is making it as well. So that's five. Then you start talking, where are they going to carry six and what were they going to do with the Miller? And that's where, uh, the attrition comes into it, and that's why we talk at the beginning of camp and say, got to wait and see what happens. Uh, sometimes there doesn't look like a path for a particular player, and all of a sudden it opens up because of injury. Uh, now Sharif is that fifth guy, uh, and you have a roster spot for him. You don't have to worry about uh, stashing him on IR or trying to get him through waivers. Uh, but you lost a, a, a player the Eagles thought was going to be pretty good for him. And there's no guarantee that Osman was that, but 
that coaching staff thought he was going to have a role on this team as a pass rusher. And I mean a role. I don't mean fifth defensive end. I mean be on the field in certain third down situations. Okay. He was going to have a role. Uh, okay, Fletcher, Malik, Jackson, Jernigan, Ridgeway, Hester, and Hector. These are all guys uh, that have had snaps on this team in the past. You go three there, you get four in. Well, there's at least going to be four. So the question is, is it four or five? And Hassan Ridgeway is going to make this team. So the four are, are pretty clear. And that's Fletcher, Malik Jackson, Tim Jernigan, and Hassan Ridgeway. So it becomes, and Trevon Hester is really ahead of Bruce Hector pretty clearly. Uh, but his issue is how many defensive linemen can he keep? Are you going to keep nine or ten? If they keep nine, he's probably not going to make the team. If he keeps ten, he'll be there. John, uh, obviously, Cyprian. We're all, uh, you know, not we're all, but uh, he, he's a guy that they brought in and kind of hinted at might play some linebacker. They have him as a third safety on this team. I guess it's further indication, which uh, they had, what, nine, uh, eight safeties on this team. McLeod, Sedejo, Cyprian, um, Elst, who's that? Trey Elston, who I've never heard of before. Malcolm Jenkins, Trey Sullivan, Blake Countess, and DeAndre Hall. So Cyprian listed as a safety here, but uh, is that, as you've seen him more now, is he getting safety reps or more linebacker reps? No, he's getting only safety reps at this point. But the Eagles uh, play a lot of big nickel, which is three safeties on the field uh, at one time. And that will only increase now that Camus Grugier Hill is not going to be available at least early in the season. Uh, I, I would imagine that package is going to increase pretty significantly. And in that, Malcolm has done it in the past, and Jonathan can do it. And, and Jim Schwartz has mentioned it, is, is, is be there and run support and be physical in that part of the game and at least hold up a little bit. So it, it's too early. He's only been here for a few days. Remember, he, got, he tore his ACL in August last year. So his first practice here was his first football practice in a year. Uh, so – He's got to knock off the rust, but the Eagles brought him to be a part of this defense. They think he's going to be a part of this defense, and there's four safeties that I think are pretty safe, uh, and that's obviously Malcolm, Rodney, Sandejo, and, and Cyprian. And then you start talking about Blake Countess and Trey Sullivan, and that's where that special teams theme comes in. Blake is a really good special teams player. Uh, all right, uh, John McMullen at JF McMullen, as you write at 973ESPN.com, working through the Wentz plan. They still really don't have uh, – Doug Peterson is really uh, playing this one here, but uh, – and we've talked about a lot. This... They know. But yeah, of course I, they I, do. I, I was joking. I, I, I don't understand. You know, the, the coaches always say the preseason is preparation for the regular season, so I joke maybe Doug is, is, is practicing his competitive advantage yeah. speak. Nobody – Nobody cares if Carson's playing. If he's playing, he's going to play eight to ten snaps. Well, I think maybe. we've gotten to the point, John, now where the fans actually don't want him to play. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, it doesn't matter one way or the the other. Uh, and Doug kind of laid it out both sides of it, and that's what I wrote about. On one hand, you want to get him back on the field because he was hurt at the end of the last season. Yeah. And if there's a cameo, I have no issue with it. And if there isn't, I have no issue with that as well. The, the preseason is about, from a quarterback standpoint, it's about getting Nate Sudfeld getting ramped up to be the backup and getting him significant reps and increasing that processing speed, getting him in a live environment because I think that's his biggest weakness. That's from from the quarterback standpoint. Uh, that's the biggest issue of the preseason. And, and if you go back, this is Carson's fourth year. He's only had one real preseason. He broke his rib that's that right. first year, yeah. and then he was coming back from the ACL last year. So you got to go back to 2017, and he had 50 snaps total right. in, in the in the preseason. So I I think it'll be. Somewhere in that range. Well, I noticed that uh, Thorson was the fourth quarterback. Yeah, well, uh, he deserves to be. <laughs> if there were a, a, 
if there were a fourth guy here besides him, he'd be fifth. I, I mean, he has just not <laughs> been good. Uh, Cody uh, Kessler, and and, it's, and he should be. I, I mean, he's a veteran guy. He started 12 games in this league, and I, I often talk about it compared to Nate Sudfeld. Forget about Clay Thorson. He just, I just talked about processing. He processes things much more quickly than Nate Sudfeld. So, yeah, he's a much better quarterback than Clayton Thorson. But there are other uh, issues aside, and their ceiling as a player. And if the Eagles believe Clayton Thorson has a uh, significant ceiling, uh, they'll carry him on the 53-man roster and just uh, not dress him and, and, and sort of redshirt him for his rookie season. Uh, if not, they could certainly get him through waivers. Guess what? There's uh, another unless, Clayton Thorson next year, I promise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, unless he lights it up in the preseason, and I see no evidence of that. The Eagles are going to have no problem getting them through waivers, so they could carry the third quarterback on the practice squad yeah. if they wanted. Uh, it's just a matter of do you want – the bigger question is do you want Cody Kessler around? And he's limited, but he's a veteran guy who understands how to play. John McMullen, more on the Eagles getting ready for Tennessee at JF McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. And, of course, tomorrow it's Eagle game day for football at 4. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mike. All right, John McMullen back tomorrow at 4. Like all guests appear to be the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.